You are listening to Walking Home from the ICU. We will be exploring how to save and preserve lives in the ICU. All opinions and views shared are unaffiliated with any organization. Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to talk to Susan East, who is a three-time ARDS survivor. ARDS, or A-R-D-S, represents acute respiratory distress syndrome which is one of the most severe forms of lung failure that occurs when the lungs fill with fluid in response to conditions such as pneumonia and sepsis. These patients require prolonged time in the ventilator and sometimes have to be paralyzed and lay face down for days. These are the patients that receive the most days on the ventilator, the most sedation, become the most delirious and the most immobile. They therefore can have the poorest long-term outcomes. So we're fortunate to have Susan with us today to give us real insight into survivorship of art. Susan, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. Tell us about your experience with ARDS. Well, I've had ARDS three times. I've had it in 2008, 2014, and then in 2017. So that's probably not the norm for most people. But um, that's been my experience with ARDS. Wow. Um, yeah. So the first time I, I got it was in 2008, and I had no clue what ARDS was. I had a sinus infection, uh, or like I thought was a sinus infection, on Monday, June 30th. And my husband went with me to the doctor. He just he always goes with me. <laughs> and they diagnosed me with a sinus infection, gave me a um, cortisone shot, sent me home with a like a steroid pack and um, you know he said I'd be better in a couple of days and I'm never one to be sick so I didn't think anything of it and my daughter lived down the street from me and she was in nurse anesthetist school at that time Mm -hmm. she was she was working uh, as a ICU nurse and so she had stopped by my home Wednesday evening for something, and she noticed that I was very irritable and she said out of sorts. And she told my husband something wasn't right. And um, so she just thought that I didn't look right, you know, and um, I thought I was just real tired. So the next day, um, she came by to check on me, and when she came by, I was blue. I was sitting up. And um, what's really odd is I wouldn't let her call 911. <laughs> I was awake enough to talk to her. And well, so I told her, no, you're not calling 911. I said, if I let you run me up to my doctor, he's a little bit friend of mine. I said, and do a chest x ray, will you please bring me home and leave me alone? <laughs> so we have that kind of relationship. <laughs> and so she agreed. And because she knew that's all she needed was just to get my foot in that door. And um, so when I got there, when I walked in the doctor's office, that that exhausted me and I collapsed. And they started taking my pulse ox with everything they had in there. And they were all reading like 42, 43. Oh, my gosh. You know, and everybody's like, oh, these things are broke. They're broke. <laughs> you know, so... They called 911, even though the hospital was right next door, and um, they did a blood gas, and they had oxygen on me. Well, by the time they did the blood gas, they got up to maybe 46, but it was right. Oh, my gosh. And so she had reason for concern, and um, so, you know, I was very, very sick, sick and oxygen-deprived, and but nobody knew I was in large. They just didn't know what was wrong with me. And rushed me over to the hospital and put me straight in ICU <clears throat> and put me on BiPAP, which was a nightmare. I'd rather be on a ventilator any day than BiPAP. Oh. It just felt like it was suffocating me. You know, I just didn't like that feeling. Right. It, you know, I don't know. But um, I just knew, you know, I could tell I was really, really sick, but I didn't know what was wrong. So anyway, um, that went on for about probably about 13, 14 hours with no success. You know, it's like any time, you know, and my family stay with me around the clock in ICU because 
any time if they weren't somebody wasn't there keeping me awake, I would doze. And as soon as I dozed, my sats dropped really low, so it wasn't working. And um, the doctor came in and told my family they said we're going to have to, you know, put her on a ventilator. Mm-hmm. And um, even you know, and and my family, even though my daughter was in school, you know, to be a nurse anesthetist. She wasn't a nurse medicine and wasn't real familiar. And the two, I'm her mother, so it's a whole different situation. Oh, yeah. So they were going to, you know, uh, medically uh, put me on a vent. And my family agreed and signed the paperwork. And so I was in a medically induced coma for probably six days. And while that transpired, you know, the strangest of things happened. That's when I experienced delusions. Um, I mean, it's some terrible, terrible dreams that I will never forget as long as I live. Uh, and that's why I never want to be sedated again the rest of my life. Um, there's other reasons too, but that's that's a lot of it. Um, so you weren't not sleeping. only that. Pardon me. So you weren't sleeping under the sedation? I was asleep, but I was I was awake. It's really hard for me to explain. I could hear what was going on in the room. Uh-huh. I mean, I was sedated, but right. I was having, like, my father-in-law was diagnosed with cancer, and my husband and my daughter were talking about it in front of me because they thought, well, she's in a, you know, a medically induced coma. She can't hear what we're saying. I heard every single thing that was said. Oh, wow. And when they brought me out of it, my daughter was there. My husband wasn't at that time. And I asked her, I said, what kind of cancer does, you know, your your grandfather have? And she looked at me like I was, she had seen a ghost. <laughs> and she said, Mom, you were on some strong drugs. He He doesn't have cancer. Oh. Well, I knew, I knew that was as far as I was going to get with her, so I let it go. Well, when my husband got there, you know, I, I asked him, I said, look, I heard y'all talking, and he told me the truth. And so they were, everybody was blown away. And there were other things I heard, too. And I could feel my husband. I told him, I said, you kissed me right here every day, didn't you? And he said, yes. Yeah. And so, you know, and that's why I, I tell people now, maybe everybody doesn't hear, but you don't know what people are hearing. So please be cautious right. of what you talk about. And could you understand what was going on? You said you were having delusions and hallucinations. Yes. What were yes. those like? Yes. I, they were terrible. Um, the delirium, and, and I'm, I'm sure that was from those strong drugs. I I was laying there and I couldn't move, you know, I'm, and I, I felt like I was pinned down, but I could, I knew I was in the hospital bed and I could see babies floating all around me and there was a fire around me and I couldn't help these babies. And it was the most terrifying feeling in the world to be lying there. There's a fire and I'm, I'm worried about these babies. I can't get to them. And they're going to die. And it was it was horrible. I mean, it was traumatic. And um, and my daughter said my blood pressure would go up and down, up and down. And I said, I can only imagine because <laughs> of what You're I was so feeling, and dream, you know, what I was going through. And, um, you know, when I, when I, and nobody, you know, at first, like, Nobody would believe me. My daughter did, and my family did, but nobody else would. And um, I have it in my charts to never be sedated unless it is absolutely 100% necessary. Wow. No matter what. Um, I am not afraid to be on a ventilator, but do not sedate me. (laughs) You know, do not sedate me. The sedation is what I'm afraid of. Um, Not only that, to me, it's harder to, to get back to where you need to be by not being I mean, I was in 08, I was then, then at a total of 28 days. I think it was six days I was medically induced. The rest of the time I was awake. And I mean, awake 
to where as soon as I, I got out of that, my family had me moved to a trauma center. And they they brought me out to move me. They had um, I was they had put me back in a medically induced coma. And as soon as I got to the uh, Louisiana State University Trauma Center, they brought me right out of it. And I was never put back under again. And I mean, I was awake as awake as I am now. Um, as soon as I got strong enough, I started journaling and writing. And um, they while put you were me still intubated. Off. Well, I was intubated, yes. Oh, good. Mm-hmm. What did that and, do for you? Uh, mentally, it made me feel like a normal person. It made me cope with, I felt normal. I didn't feel like somebody who was laying there in a vegetated state or someone who couldn't do for herself that I, I felt like I can overcome this. Uh-huh. This is not a death sentence. This is something that I can get better and I can overcome this. This is not going to overcome me. It gave me more control of of it. And you were able and allowed to participate. Yes, and that was so important because there came a point in time, probably into my fifth week of you know, good days, bad days, where my doctor came in one day and she said, we, I need to do a long boxy just to see if I can find something. And my husband and my daughter and my son-in-law, he, he was also working there and they said, no. And I looked at the doctor because I was on a vent Uh and I said, I pointed to me and she said, because I didn't have a tablet in front of me, I just pointed to me. She said, can you sign? She goes, absolutely. I said, I pointed my thumb up. I said, okay. I said, and I did like sign. She uh-huh. brought me the paperwork and I sat there and signed it in front of everybody. And they prepped me and took me down, <laughs> you know. And that was very important to me. I wanted to be in control yeah. because I mentally was fine. And because of that, when she, they did it, they uh, they found like a, a sack of fluid when they cut into me, and it released it, and I started getting better immediately. Huh. And that you know my fam, and, and that's what I've told my family since then because you know I've had had it twice since then. You're not in control of me unless I can't be in control of me. I'm in control of me. And they stopped taking away the control. Or they give the control back to you when they allowed you to wake up. Exactly. It's my say then. I love it. Were you walking and, and people later have to that feel time? that. People have to feel that. Patients have to feel that in order to feel strong and to get better. They have to be able to do it for themselves as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, and there's some dignity that's preserved in that, Correct. Um, while you were awake there, were you mobile? Were you walking? No, I had, I literally had a tube in every opening in my body except my ears. Um, they came and tried to get me up a couple of times, but I had been flat on my back for so long I couldn't stand up. I just would crumble. And that was the unfortunate thing in 08 that they didn't work on mobility as much. So when I was discharged, I was discharged to a rehab facility via ambulance because I couldn't stand up. And so when I was sent to this place, I mean, at that point in time, I could get up on a walker and go to the bathroom, but they wouldn't let me. So I was in this facility and only two times a day for maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, they would take us down this room and exercise like eight of us at a time and then put us back in our room and we'd lay in that bed all day. Uh Well, I'm real stubborn and pigheaded. And I I thought to myself, I'm going to be here six weeks. And that's what they were telling me, six weeks. And I said, I looked around and those people had been there for a long time. And I said, no, this is not going to work for me. So my daughter told me, because she thought she could make me believe anything because she was in the medical field. She said, Mom, if you check yourself out, they're not gonna, your insurance will not pay your medical bills. 
said, okay. So when she left, I picked up my purse, I called my insurance company, and I said, if I check myself out, will you pay my medical bills? And they said, well, of course. What is your plan of action? And I told them. I said, a very good friend of mine, I'm, he's a physical therapy, field physical therapist. He owns a, a rehab center. I've already spoken with him. My sister's coming, flying in from Houston. She's going to take me every day. I will walk faster. And they said, well, if you have a plan then, and you think it will work for you, then yes. So I called down to the nurse's station, told him I said, get the paperwork ready. I'm checking out. And I called my husband. I said, come get me. And I checked myself out. And within the following week, I was up on a walker walking all around my house. Hmm. And I wouldn't have been if I had stayed there. Now, do I recommend that for everybody? No. But I knew what I needed because mobility is one of the most important things. And see, that's another reason I don't like sedation because if you're sedated and on meds, you're not going to be able to get up and walk. Right. It makes me wonder um, if you hadn't been sedated for those first six days mm-hmm. and you've been walking exactly. right away, if you would have not have gotten so behind. Exactly. That's the problem. And see, in 2014, I didn't have that problem because I was not sedated. Now, in 2017, it was a different situation because um, I had left my home and drove three states away to meet my daughter and her husband at a beach house. And I'd only been there six hours and she found me unresponsive in my room. No. And I had to be airlifted to a hospital and I was in a real coma for seven or nine days. So I couldn't get up. Yeah. So I had the mobility problem there too, but I got myself up and got, I got myself walking right away. But as soon as I got out of that coma and I could get up, I made them get me up, you know. That was your request. It wasn't my, necessarily protocol. My request, you... for, my, for my request. Because for one, I didn't want my lungs to get pneumonia. You know, I had oh. meningitis and I was in arts again. Oh. So I knew I had to, and I'd been dented twice at that hospital. So when I got off the vent the second time, I told them, I said, I have to get up. I have to get up out of this bed and walk. You know, walking is the best thing to prevent me from keep getting pneumonia again. Yes. And I have to walk. I said, I don't care if somebody's on ventilator, they should be walking. There's a way. Yes. Yes. You know, you have to do that. You have to walk. And um, as a matter of fact, I just had a back surgery November 18th. And the doctors were freaking out because I only have 38% total lung capacity left Mm -hmm. and it was one of the situations where I had to have this surgery and so the team was all working to get me prepared and I told them all I said y'all do your thing but the one thing you better have on hand is a physical therapist ready to get me up out of the bed that day and walk me (laughs) because that's most important to me oh I love it I want to walk I want to walk because you have to the mobility the, the mobility and not being sedated, not taking a lot of medications, not, I said, no morphine pack, no, none of that stuff. You know, you can't do it. You can't do it in heal. And it sounds like your independence is really important to you. It's very important to me because I know that if I don't, if I don't take care of my medical plan and, and I don't oversee my getting better Nobody knows how I really feel. Right. It's your body. And nobody else. It's my body, yes. Um, Did you have to go to rehab the other times you had arts? No. I did it. Well, I did. um, But I did it, you know, like when I got home from Alabama, I did it. uh, I had some, they had someone come to my home and rehab me. And of course, you know, I'm, I walk and I keep myself in good shape and then I know what to do. And like when I would lay in the hospital bed, I would work my legs and work my stuff. And, um, because I was so careful, I didn't want, like, I didn't want my feet to fall. Um, mm-hmm. you know, cause your feet will fall flat if you're not careful, if you're laying there too long and, you know, I, I would lift my legs up and, you know, it's just, 
luckily I knew a lot of the things to do. Because of what you experienced the first time? Yes. Mm -hmm. And because of my daughter and my son-in-law being ICU nurses, they knew a lot of things to help me with. But that's why I advocate and try to help so many people because I know that these things are so important and they don't get told that, um, you know, nurses don't have time to sit and do all this. Right. They and we just don't have it. Right. And we have some, um, some barriers, barriers with sedation still. Mm-hmm. So it's, sometimes it's hard for us to believe, um, let alone incorporate the fact that someone can and should be awake while on the ventilator. Right. I have pictures of me that I have posted um, on Facebook trying to show people where I, in Mobile, I was, I didn't even know they took it. I was sitting there on the ventilator. I'd come out of my coma probably the day before. And I was sitting on there looking at Facebook or something and just as normal as can be, you know. Well, we'll, um, let's, we'll snag those pictures and post them on our blog so sure. that our listeners can Absolutely. see. Um, I think a lot of people haven't seen what it looks like to be awake on the ventilator. So that would be really yeah. useful, I think. Yeah, because it, um, you know, I think a lot of it is you have to get positive mentally. Um, you're going to overcome it. And there's a lot of people I talk to on these private message boards, you know, and they're like, well, I'm scared I'll get it twice. I'm like, well, I've had it three times and it's okay. You can do it. Yeah. You know, not saying you will get it a second time, but if it happens, you will do it. You can do it. And how did you go about making that declaration that you do not want sedation? Is that part of your directives? Yes. It's in my, it's in my, I had my attorney draw it up. Oh, <laughs> yes. wow. It's in my, in my, I had my, I went to my attorney and had it drawn up that way. No, that's, a, that's impressive. And I, I would declare the same thing, even though I haven't ever been on a ventilator, but I've seen the variation in outcomes and that's what I want, what, would want for myself, but it's so much more powerful coming from someone that has had it both ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, how is your life yeah. now after three rounds of arts? You know, my, it, you know, my life is good. Arts does not scare me. Um, when I had this surgery in November, there was a 50% chance I was not going to live because of my lungs. And there was a very good chance I was going to have ARDS. I was not afraid. I'm not afraid of it. Um, if I get it, I get it. If I get it, I'll deal with it and I'll overcome it. Um, as long as you're not sedated. As long as I'm not sedated. If I'm sedated, I have no control over it. Mm-hmm. I can overcome it if I can fight it. But if I'm not awake to fight it, I can't do anything about it. I like it. I totally agree. You know, I have to fight it. I'm the only one that can do it. Yeah, I, I think we forget that patients have to participate. I think we forget that patients can and should participate in the fight, in the journey. Yes, they have to. They have to. And you have to make them understand they're strong enough to do this. They can do this. There's nothing to be afraid of. It's just a tube. <laughs> it's just a what? tube. I, know, I, know. I mean, it's an uncomfortable tube and it's a scary situation. Um, but I, I see with my patients that if we don't make them confused with the sedation and the narcotics and the benzodiazepines, that's it. they can really have clear brains and cope with it and participate and express themselves and make decisions. So it's really refreshing to hear that because that's what I felt when I care for patients is that that's what is right for patients. So hearing it from you just brings it home. And encouraging them to journal their journey Uh helps them to journaling their journey if they can. You know, it helps them. Um, Being clear-headed for one helps because when you're sedated, I just don't think that anybody can think straight. First of all, when you're sedated, it's you're masking whatever's wrong. For one, it's not really helping. And you know, you can't think straight. You can't think logically about the situation you're in. And that's just going to make it worse. You know, clear headed, you can stop and rationalize and think, you know, I mean, I have panic attacks, you know, I have PTSD, but I can deal with it because I can rationalize and stop and think 
about the situation and, you know, how I want my life to be. Uh-huh. I'm not going to let that control me. I'm going to control it. But if you're sedated, those tools are taken away from you. So absolutely. I have no control. So great. So, Susan, you're spot on. Are you, were you working before? Are you working again? What is your functionality like? Yeah, we have, uh, we own our own business and um, just now, I mean, I'm, I do the accounting work and um, I don't go in there now as much. I do a lot of it from home, uh-huh. but um, I'm getting to where I'm going back a little bit more at a time. Um, it's taken me a while, you know, to get back to going over there and stuff. I, you know, I just, I don't know why. I just haven't. A lot of it's energy, you know. I'm tired a lot. And I have three grandbabies now, so that's a lot of it, too. (laughs) Which is good. That's That's a good reason. Yes, very good reason. Um, But, you know, I'm, but, and two, uh, I volunteer a lot. I I like to, you know, I'm very active with, um, you know, doing stuff with arts and other things locally uh, in my community to help out. And that's very important to me to give back because I feel like I've, I've been very fortunate and, you know, I just want to help and give back to others. I love it. Well, I feel like your testimonial is an incredible contribution to the discussion that we're having. Um, what would you say to ICU providers caring for patients on ventilators? I'm sorry, what was that? What would you... What would you say to ICU providers caring for patients that are on ventilators? Um, I would say if you're, you know, caring for patients on ventilators, try and treat them as normal as possible. Make them feel as normal as possible because they need to feel like that machine is no different than an IV or anything else, honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, um, people fear IVs, but they don't need to. Um, People fear giving blood. They don't need to. You know, especially when you or once you have been on an IV, I mean, an event or you've had ARDS, you're going to have other issues come up. It's just a part of your life, uh-huh. you know, or I have. And I just try to think of everything. I just like it's just a part of my life. And I don't think of anything as, you know, scary or bad. I just kind of laugh at it and go with it. That's my life now. And I'm just lucky I have a life, you know, and everybody needs to be, nobody needs to be afraid of these machines. Hmm. These machines are saving our lives. Um, It's just like when I was moved in 08, I was moved to put on ECMO and I was mentally prepared for ECMO. You just, you know, you have to, you know, These machines, you know, some people are like, now you may have to be put on a vent. No. If you're going to be put on a vent, you're, hey, you're going to be, might be put on this vent and it's going to save your life. But you know what? You can do this. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, Mind over matter. Positive, positive, positive. positive. I like it. Um, And I think one of the concerns as ICU providers, is that if patients are awake, they'll pull their tube out. Um, but mm-hmm. what you're saying and what I've seen is that when we allow them to be awake and understand and clear-headed, that they understand that, that tube is keeping them alive. And they pretend... I ne- never once tugged at my tube, ever. Right. Because I wasn't afraid of it. I knew what it was there for. Right. Because you weren't confused anymore. No. Mm-mm. There was no confusion. None. Well, this is been... yeah. You know, when I was when I was medically sedated um, at that one hospital, and that was a very bad experience. I can remember when the very first time they put me in a chair when they brought me out of it, and they put me in a chair to feed me, and this was horrible. They put that tray in front of me, and I thought, okay, you know, because I I really couldn't comprehend what was going on because I was drugged, I was just druggy. And I said, feed yourself. And I was like, I can't. And I said, yes, you can. And I literally couldn't. And I felt like I was being shamed because I couldn't get that spoon or fork or whatever to my mouth. Wow. And, you know, I think that was the worst thing in the world, but the best for me because it made me realize 
I will never depend on anybody to help me again. <laughs> but by not doing that means I cannot get in that mental state. They can't drug me like that again because that's why I couldn't do it. Right. I love it. And I think more patients would have your, your fighting spirit if we allowed them to. Yes, absolutely. I think so too. I really do. People are stronger than they realize when they have to be. They can do it. They can really do it. But if we weaken them with days and of mobility and delirium, then, then we take away their, their capacities to cope and but, to work. Yes. And then they stand the risk of getting you know, dependent on something or thinking they need it, and they don't. And that's why we have such an addiction problem in our world today. Yep. And it, it kind of starts with those first moments in the ICU. It does. Well, Susan, thank I mean, you so much. This has been so helpful. Well, you're so welcome. And I'm going to email you those pictures. And um, you're more than welcome to use them. However, you know, whatever I can do to help, I'm here to help. Thank you. You're such a great use resource. And we'll, we'll keep using you. We'll come back. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, Absolutely. Susan. Thank you.